G'day guys, what's going on? Welcome to this episode of Aussie English, the number one podcast for anyone and everyone on wanting to learn Australian English, culture and history. More Australian culture and history today than English, although it's in English. Anyway, so today I had a sort of interesting story for you guys. I had been chatting with a guy online uh, named Ian Carpenter, who is today's guest, and this was a few years ago. We got chatting, I think, about a film called Sweet Home, which I actually never got round to seeing. We were chatting when it was, I think, getting hyped up to be released, and it was an Australian film about Indigenous uh, affairs and issues and history. And so, I was chatting to him then, and he recently contacted me again, probably a year or a year and a half after our first contact, and was like, hey, Pete, um, do you want to catch up sometime and uh, we can chat about things? We could do an episode on the podcast. I'm also an English teacher, so it'd be great to, to catch up. So, anyway, today, Ian and his student, Anna, who is from Brazil, came down to our house in Ocean Grove and had lunch with us and hung out. And we started getting into a pretty deep conversation. I heard all about how he ended up being an English teacher, although I uh, wasn't recording it at the time. This was just banter over lunch. Damn, should have kept it. It was a really good story, really interesting story. But I wanted to get him on the podcast to talk to him about being a fellow uh, Caucasian Australian who has a passion for Indigenous history and culture. I wanted to get him on the podcast to talk about Australia, Australian history, as well as Indigenous Australia and Indigenous Australian history. Obviously, this is from the point of view of two Caucasian European heritage guys. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. We are still sort of learning a lot about Indigenous culture, but I sort of wanted to give you guys a window into... I guess what it was like for us as European Australians growing up in Australia and the kind of exposure we had to the Indigenous part of Australia, as well as the average Australian's views of Indigenous affairs in Australia. Anyway, we kind of just set off and started talking about issues and our opinions. Take it for what it's worth. I hope you get a lot out of it, guys. Uh, There's some interesting topics in there. I'm sure you'll get a load of different language out of it, and you'll also hopefully learn a bit about Australian culture and history, Indigenous Australia, And, yeah, hopefully a lot more. Anyway, let's get into it. I give you guys in Carpenter. Welcome to the podcast, guys. This is an impromptu podcast. Kel's sitting in the background. We have a special guest here in the background too, Anna. But I have Ian Carpenter. I've said that right. You have. Take it. Ian Carpenter. And Noah. (laughs) Screaming in the background. And, um, well, do you want to... How did you end up here today, Ian? (laughs) <laughs> Let's just start from the start. Well, um, I've, uh, like many other people, I've discovered your videos and your podcasts. And um, I think we actually spoke a couple of years ago. Um, I'd seen a comment you made somewhere online to do with... Um, That's a good one, not a bad one. D- yeah. um, no, I think it was... Um, from memory, it, w- it had something to do with uh, uh, a film called Sweet Country. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I actually got to see that in the end because it was before that was released, right? Mm. This was a, a movie about Indigenous Australians. It's a brutal movie and I really yeah. recommend you see it. That's the most annoying thing about Australian films. They're so hard to find online, mm. especially and like to remember when they're going to... Yeah, you you hear all the news when they get first hyped up, and then I always tend to get. (laughs) Well, I always recommend to anybody living in Australia to tune into NITV, yeah, Channel Thirty Four, yeah, and um, all of these movies will eventually Uh... pop up. And not only that, but um, there's so much going on in Indigenous Australia, in literature, in art, in in television, in movies, in so many fields, uh, Indigenous people are excelling and um, you'll see it all on ITV, uh, on NITV, I yeah, should say. Yeah, Well, this, I wanted to talk to you about Indigenous people today eventually, but we can dive into that Yeah, first. no, no. I kind of had my mind blown by that recently because I guess as, a, as an Australian growing up in suburban Australia, probably in a town of 99% Caucasian British heritage Australians, you don't really come across many Indigenous people. And so, your your view of, quote-unquote, Indigenous Australia tends to be pretty skewed, right? I mean, I don't know what it was like for you growing up, but I was definitely, as a 
white Australian privileged male growing up in this safe, well-off neighbourhood, it's it's difficult to really understand what it's like as life as an Indigenous person in Australia. And I recently read a book called Australian Aborigines. Um, I've forgotten the author. I'll have to include that later on. But that was like that was like reading a, a play of someone screaming at you for like twenty hours. Mm. Like that was just brutal after brutal after brutal moment in there. So. I guess, how did you first sort of learn about, um, how were you taught about Indigenous culture growing up? Well, I wasn't, basically. Because that's what I was going to say. We, uh, I grew up, as you did, that, right? yeah. in, the, in the privileged Australia. And uh, it wasn't until, um, well, no, in my years of school, uh, we um, saluted the Union Jack. We sang God Save the Queen. And we were taught that everything started with Captain Cook. I think my version of that was everything started with Captain Cook, except now it was the um, Australia Advance Australia Fair yeah. National Anthem and the Australian flag. Well, the, well, the British Australian flag. If you yeah, <laughs> well, P- Peter is now showing up my age. You see, <laughs> um, but anyway. Um, when I was traveling over um, in Europe, when I was living in Europe in the um, 70s, in particular in Spain, uh, I was often asked about Aboriginal Australia. What did I know about um, our first people? And I was often embarrassed to say that not much. And this is why I've wanted to talk about this on the podcast more, because I've had a lot of people ask me about this. And uh, mm. besides feeling incredibly unqualified, both in experience and knowledge, <laughs> to mm. really comment on the the topic very well. That's why I thought it would be good yeah. to have yeah. other Australians on here, hopefully in the future more Indigenous Australians, although they're pretty hard to find around Ocean Grove where I currently live. Although I hear Kathy Freeman lives here somewhere. <laughs> um you, you'd be surprised, actually. There are, there are Indigenous people scattered all throughout Australia that, mm. as we, we were talking before, you, you, you don't always know. Yeah. You can't always tell. By just looking and, at them. And most Indigenous people, even if they're a small percentage Indigenous, they still feel Indigenous. But it's um, almost a hard conversation to have, too, It right? is. Mm-hmm. It feels like... Well, any one of any other race, it can be quite difficult, especially as a white person, to really try and ask them about what it's like, or you know, of that race, or to learn about their culture, because it tends to come from a position where you feel like you're you don't have the right to ask that, right? Mm. So in Australia, was it difficult when you did start learning more about Indigenous culture? And no, but I had to make a conscious effort to yeah. do that. Uh, when I came back from overseas, it was something I was determined to do. Yeah. And um, one day I, uh, in the early 90s, um, I, I read one day a, a, um, a pamphlet from Melbourne University um, showing uh, what courses were available uh, or coming up. Um, and there was one there called... Um, Understanding Black Australia. Mm. And it was a course by a guy called Gary Foley. I don't know if you've heard of him, but... Um, the surname rings a bell. In, in, um, in Aboriginal Australia, he's a kind of a Che Guevara. Yeah. You know, he... he... I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard when he... well, Marxist thinks that yeah. Che Guevara is a hero, <laughs> but I think... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Let's just say he's a freedom fighter. Okay. Right. And, and, so he's um, got a bit of good and bad in him. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and Gary Foley's actually, um, he's now Dr. Gary Foley. Um, he's finally com- completed his studies at Melbourne University, which he's been doing for many, many years. But um, in the days of the uh, tent embassy in Canberra mm. and the... Um, That's the, the world's longest ever protest, mm, by the way, I mm-hmm. think, 40 years or something, right? He was right there in the forefront of that. Yeah. And he was in the forefront of the um, bicentennial um, protests at the... Um, oh, 1988, was it? At, at, at the uh, Commonwealth Games in Brisbane. Yeah. And he, he's been fighting for Aboriginal people... Forever. This is how ignorant I am 
and probably a good representation of the average the average Australian. When I went to Canberra and I saw the tent set up in front of old Parliament House, I was I had no idea what it was. Mm. Totally, I was like, mm. why are there all these homeless people at the front of this in the middle of this um, field where there doesn't seem to be much going on? It's an old building that's mm. no longer used. Yep. And only later, after I actually moved away from Canberra, because I only ever saw this thing from a distance. I realised that it was a protest, um, an indigenous protest that had been set up there in the 80s, mm-hmm. is it? Maybe even earlier than that. No, it was the 70s. Even... Yeah, um, 70s, okay. Yeah. And um, and it's been there's been people there ever since. Right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. pretty much. Um, it was removed and then they came back. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, it was brutally removed at one point. I think I and remember... There's a, lot of, that, yeah. there's a lot of archival footage that you can source on uh, YouTube and um, on the usual sort of um, places. But um, it was um, a part of an ongoing struggle which has been going since the beginning of colonisation. But anyway, this I decided I was going to do this course. It was a week-long course at Melbourne Uni um, and... It was one of the best things I've ever done in my life because... How, how was it set up? It was basically just in one of the lecture theatres in Melbourne Uni and it was mm. just Gary at the lectern and there were about uh, 30 of us in the, in the course. Yeah. One of the course, uh, one of the people on the course who I got to spend a bit of time with was a lady called Judith Durham. Mm. who was the lead singer with The Seekers. Oh, really? Yes. And um, she um, had... The Seekers were no longer a group at that time, although Mm. since then they have got back together and um, with a lot of success again. But uh, she was um, very interested in learning more about Aboriginal culture and um, she had also had a, an education similar to ours um, and um, but she knew there was more to it and she she wanted to uh, um, you know learn more and why, why do you think it is that we had that education growing up I, always, I often think like why were we not taught more about indigenous Australians do you think in the classroom well <sighs> Is it partly too because they're kind of like not one monolithic unit? You have hundreds of quote unquote indigenous Australian groups, right? They're not just indigenous Australians. No, they're not. They're no. hundreds of different groups with different yep. languages, with yep. different cultures, different beliefs. Yep. And so it's pretty hard to just go to school and learn about all indigenous people, right? That's true. That's true. But, um, and it's very complex. Um, I mean, the, but the the thing that I often come back to when I think about it is that we're we're very much a nation which is um, we we've still got the training wheels on as a mm. nation. Um, it's only been two hundred and thirty odd years, um, and about the first hundred years we were still pretty much a an outpost of Britain. Yep. Um, it's not until nineteen hundred and one you know, federation that we actually became a nation under our own name with our own flag. And, yep. and you know, we, we, we're we maturing. Uh, we've been maturing ever since. And, and I believe that right now we have reached a stage where we, we are sincerely believing that we've done a lot wrong when it comes to Indigenous Australia. Mm. And I believe that there is a groundswell um, of average Australians who would like to right those wrongs. And so things are changing. And as as I said before, um, despite everything, Indigenous people are excelling in so many fields. And, um, you know, we now have, I think, five representatives in in the Parliament and the yeah. Senate, um, we've had um, uh, you know serious discussions about treaties and serious discussions about um, uh, changing the um, 
constitution and you know we, because we, until what year were indigenous people still seen as flora or fauna 68 in, in the constitution right so, 68 yeah so was that 50 years ago yeah yeah it's and that's what I mean. And um, they didn't. They got the vote way after Australian women got the vote, right? Yep. So we, Australian women had suffrage in the early 1900s, and indigenous. Yep. Meanwhile, indigenous men and women mm. were were like, uh, "Hello, that's <laughs> right. Can, can we have a say?" That's right. And I um, mean, the indigenous servicemen after the First and Second World Wars came back to Australia, and unlike their white counterparts. They got no help with housing. Mm. They weren't welcome in the RSLs. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean... Um, well, and some of the stuff they were given, I was reading about a few guys who returned, I think, from First World War, and they would often be given land like the other soldiers, but it mm. would be completely garbage. Yeah. That they couldn't grow anything on, and then even when they tried to make a go of it, quite often they, the land would be taken back or they would be forced to yeah. sell it, or and so they were oppressed kind of... Uh, you know, I guess it would be like indirectly in a lot of ways, whether or not it was mm. someone coming to them with a gun and saying, you can't do this. Yeah. It would be that there were constant hurdles set up in the way of them where for other people that wouldn't be the case. Like I think when they were stockmen, I was reading, that was one of the most atrocious things. They became stockmen in the late 1800s and early 1900s in parts of Australia where they absolutely dominated at their job. They were doing an amazing you know, um, they had an amazing set of skills and they could work as hard as anyone else, but they would be paid a fifth or a tenth of the right. average stockman would be paid who wouldn't work anywhere near as hard yep. as them. And it was simply because of their race. That's right. And, I mean, uh, a lot of Australian people would be familiar with um, the Paul Kelly song, From Little Things, Big Things Grow. About Marbo, right? No, no. Is that, that about Marbo? That, that, no, that's about a stockman's ah, strike. Okay. The Gurindji yeah. In in the in the Northern Territory, they were stockmen working for a, um, a wealthy British landowner mm -hmm. who was paying them a pittance. Yeah. And they decided that they weren't going to take it anymore, and uh, they went on strike. Right for more money eventually as well. Right. Well, it started out that way, um, but it grew into basically the first land rights claim. Um, they realized that they were being ripped off not only financially, but um, they spent a lot of time sitting in the dust think, mm. thinking about their... Oh, what was the name of the guy? Lingari? Or... Lingari, uh, yeah. That's who I'm thinking about, not Marbo. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, sure. and I think uh, there's a... Is it, um, uh, is it a suburb of Canberra that's named after him? These days could be I'm not or, sure. somewhere. There's a lot of indigenous yeah. names suburbs around there. Yeah, so. um, but uh, it, that's a famous um, story, which it's it's pretty well um, told in the song yeah. from Little Things, Big Things Grow, which was written by Paul Kelly with um, with uh, in collaboration with an Aboriginal. Yeah. Um, singer songwriter whose name escapes me right at this moment you guys all know the song though because it gets yes. played all over the place yeah. right and covered by a lot of people too Ab absolutely kev carmody is his name um but um that that was an inspiration to to many people and it was as i said the 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 very first uh, of the land rights claims yeah and they succeeded um and but it took years. Yeah, they literally sat down in the dust yeah. and thought about their plight, and said, "You know, this is this is not just about money. This is about much more than money." And they they eventually won with the help of um, some good-hearted white legal people mm. from Sydney and Melbourne. And I might add, with the help of um, Australian trade unions mm. who had heard about what was happening, and um, as is usually the case, um, the trade unions were prepared to stand up for the workers. And uh, so that's a that's a famous um, episode in this in this tragic history. Mm. Um, but getting back to 
the the week I spent with Gary Foley, uh, that was um, really enlightening. Um, well, what did you learn about? What was he mainly trying to sort of educate you on? Or is the, the, everything? The, the, <laughs> the course was pretty... <laughs> Pretty straight down the line, understanding black Australia. But what does that mean, right? It just yeah. means... Um, In terms of their history or their, it, their oppression? It, or their... It, it touched on all of those things mm. and, and it, and it uh, was um, delivered by someone who had experienced all of those things. Yeah. And um, it, it was just incredible because... the. So much of what I learnt in that week was new to me, mm. and yet that's kind of embarrassing in and of itself, it is, right? It is, yeah, it is because, and that's how I feel every time I find out new things about mm. Indigenous culture. And, mm. You know, you're just kind of like, why haven't I ever been told about this? Yeah. Or why haven't I ever been in a position where this was easy to learn about? And and in Aboriginal history, there are many great people. Um, you know, Albert Namajira, Charlie Perkins, um, you know, Mabo. Mm. Um, there have been many great leaders and many great, um, people that have fought for uh, their people in, in many states, in many places. And as you mentioned before, um, you know, Aboriginal Australia is a very complex thing. There are many languages, many tribes. And people want different things. That's right. This is what blew my mind. I watched a 60 Minutes story the other day with Pauline Hanson going to Ayers Rock because she wanted to climb the rock. For, for background knowledge, Pauline Hanson is, I guess, a right-wing um, nationalist in yep. Australia. I don't really know how to describe her other than that. She's very well, controversial. We will be polite. <laughs> yeah, she's considered to be incredibly racist, although to give her the sort of benefit of the doubt, I don't hear... I hear her saying many more ignorant things than I think explicitly racist things when she says stuff. But anyway, she went to Ayers Rock, or Uluru, and wanted to climb it before it gets closed on, in October. And the the weird thing about seeing this was that she went... And she explicitly spoke to the elders there and asked them permission to do so. And the elders were, at least from the perspective of the the report, were saying they want it to stay open because they want tourist money there and they want these jobs. And then when Pauline went to, uh, I think she was at a restaurant or a hotel, there were all these Indigenous women working there as managers and, and waiters and stuff. And they were like, no, we need to close it. It's offensive and, you know, this is just horrible. And she was like, are you from Mm. this part of Australia? And they were like, no, we're from, you know, way up north in Darwin. And she's like, but how can you have this view of land that isn't your land, that's these people's land? They, This is what they want, but you want this other thing. And then too, when she said, well, where do you think I should, like... I'm as Australian as you guys. I was born here. And one of them was like, no, go back home to England. And she's like, I'm not English or whatever. And so it's weird that you have this, both sides can tend to be a bit bigoted, but also Indigenous people can want exclusive, mutually exclusive things, which make it even Mm. more complicated, right? Because you do have people hoisting the flag saying we shouldn't climb Uluru because it's um, a sacred site and it's offensive, you know? And I think my opinion now would be, whether or not I can, I'm probably not going to ever do it because it's. I, I don't need to. I can walk around it, right? Mm. But at the same time, there may be people who are Indigenous who are from that area who want that thing to, you know, go a different way from the loudest voices. Yeah. And, and that's what makes it so screwed up, right? A lot of the time, mm. these things have uh, conflicting sides. And it's hard, I think, in today's day and age too, with this sort of leftist, the rise of the leftism and... Um, what do you call it again? Identity politics. Mm. It's very difficult to know whether people are genuinely <clears throat> trying to do what's best for a certain group or a certain area, or if they're trying to score moral points. Mm. You know? And so it is very bizarre because I think we get that conflation, right? When we ask Indigenous people, what do you want regarding this thing that is, say, Uluru, that actually should only involve the people whose land it is, you get very different conflicting Point. So I can imagine it's very difficult to really work out what's the best thing to do. <laughs> That's right. But, um, it's a hornet's nest. It is. But Aboriginal people are no different to every other kind of people in that 
they will always have differing views. Yep. Um, but I have been to Uluru and the experience of being there left me in, in no doubt that it is a sacred site. Mm. And I was, I felt ashamed to see all these people refusing to um, reading the signs at the base of the rock mm. that are in every possible language, yeah. asking you not to climb it. Mm. Um, and for those very reasons that it's considered a sacred site, those signs were put there by yeah. the, um, the people of that area. And, and the disregard that so many people have for that mm. was just shocking, you know. And so they've come to this conclusion after many years of trying passively yeah. to to ask people politely not to do it. Yeah. Um, they've just come to this conclusion that, all right, we just have to stop people from doing it. Yeah. And apart from anything else, it's really dangerous. <laughs> they were Pauline didn't even get to the top, right? She crapped herself because it was windy. <laughs> and people have died on there. They've had yeah, heart attacks, they've yeah, slipped, yeah. yeah, all sorts and, of stuff. And probably al- more likely to die on Uluru than get eaten by a shark. And yeah. also, by the time you get to the top yeah. in the heat... In several hours, right? And you've been drinking heaps and heaps of water. When you get to the top, there's no toilets. Yep. There's no facilities whatsoever. So, you know... Yep. And, and, you know, you shouldn't be... be behaving like that um, in a place that is considered sacred. You know, I wouldn't mm. go and climb all over the Vatican. I wouldn't and go take and take a dump on the yeah. roof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know. Um, so it is, it is pretty weird to think that that, yeah, because I think a lot of the problems too is like pollution, people crap on top of it, piss yeah. on top of it. It ends up getting into a concentrated kind of yeah. mess, right? And then it rains and it goes down into the water systems and poisons yeah. those. And so it is a big I problem. mean, you know, I, 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 I had a similar um, feeling when I, when I walked around Machu Picchu or, mm. when, or when I walked around uh, Granada or Cordoba or places where mm. that, that are just so stunningly beautiful and so, you know, uh, and yet this is... Um, this is something that was not created by man. It's uh, it's a it's a, a a natural phenomenon, you know. Yeah. And and it's um, something that is to be, uh, you know. I felt in awe uh, every time I went near it, morning, noon, or night. I just couldn't take my eyes off it. It was just an amazing. Well, ironically, the interesting stuff's probably all around. It the is. Outside, it anyway, is. Not on top of it. It, it is. And, and that yeah. thing that you've gone there to see is Uluru, and the moment you get on top of it, it's the only thing you can't see. <laughs> yeah. And and to see what everyone sees from above, I saw that in a light plane. Yeah, exactly. I went up in a light yeah. plane. Yeah. Okay. Well, you see it, even higher, right? It, it cost me a couple of hundred bucks, but it was just the most amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I could do that without, um, you, you know, without um, going against the wishes of of the people, yeah. and and um, you know, it was just an amazing experience which I'll never forget. But yeah, I mean, Aboriginal people have been. Uh, swept aside, they've been ignored. I think that's they've the been... biggest problem, right? That <laughs> people aren't explicitly asking them what they want a yeah. lot of the time. Yeah. They just want to be heard and to have autonomy. And mm. I think whether we're trying to help them or trying to oppress them, quite often the autonomy is taken away from them, right? Yeah. And they're told what they can or can't do. Yep. Some of the biggest thing things for me to sort of work out whether I'm for or against is, say, making alcohol illegal in certain towns. Because you're kind of like, we would never imagine doing that to any other race in Australia or no. any other group in Australia, and yet we do it to the Indigenous people in Australia. Although, I think most of the time, they decide that's what they want to do, you know, in the town. The the elders or the people on the council end up choosing that to happen. Yeah. But th- that's sort of more of that complexity, right, of like, you have one set of rules for one group of people and one for another, and how do you ever get out of this system? Well, I think... Um, I think Aboriginal people ought to be viewed as a very special case because I can't think of another race on earth 
that has been as dispossessed as they have. And so... The Native Americans would be on the same sort of level, wouldn't they, to some extent? Some of the ones that live on reservations. Well, you, you have to remember that Native Americans signed all kinds of treaties. Yeah. And they had all kinds of uh, arrangements. And they ended up on reservations and places because that was what was decided. Yeah in in um, consultation with them until it was found and, there was and, gold on and, those yeah, reservations exactly exactly <laughs> but but in in our case in australia i mean um they were just never asked they were never asked they yeah. were uh, as we know up until 1968 just considered flora and fauna mm. and um so were not worthy of an opinion yeah not worthy of an opinion so, you know, as tragic as it is, as I said before, I feel very um, um, positive about how things are heading at the moment. I just think that there are more and more people yeah. who are understanding, beginning to understand and doing as I did, learning a bit more. Uh, the more you learn about Aboriginal people, the more incredible... Um, you you see them and and i mean really more than anything we 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 have lost so much by having this attitude you know we ha there's so much mm -hmm. to gain from embracing them and bringing them in and and making them a part of what is it we all know that this is a great country yeah it could be so much greater do you think that's why it's that's been... what's missing that's that's yeah. that's that's really in many ways it's the soul of our country do you think that's why it's been a bit of a stain on our history for a long time it's a massive it's a yeah. massive stain on our history yeah it really is and um you know and and in so many ways we have such a great history but our focus has been in develop at all cost you know yeah. um like like all the um like all the imperialists in history we've chosen the best places to build our cities yeah. on the coast and so the aboriginal people that were at sydney cove and the aboriginal people that were in places well, like pretty much anywhere there's a big city those people no longer exist <laughs> that's right those people were just pushed aside yeah you know yeah and for, for yeah, whether whether directly or indirectly right i remember yeah. reading about that in the book and it being in sydney cove for example they were there for a long time although it was a matter of the british setting up shop and being like so this is where we live mm. now you mm. guys can you know live outside of here but this is where we live mm. and then the cattle and the sheep pushing out destroying all the mm. land where they were fishing and all of the yeah all of the grasslands and everything so that they were pushed out further diseases going through and yeah. massacring people you know smallpox and everything so whether it was a direct thing or an indirect thing mm. they were constantly pushed outwards one of the interesting things i was reading about too is that they were quite often um mortal enemies of other clans and other tribes so i think they had a basic rule broadly speaking that if they could speak the same language intelligibly um, they would be on good terms but if someone spoke a language they couldn't understand the assumption was enemy kill them because it's safer than you know trying to just get by when you can't communicate and so quite often these tribes got pushed off their land and further and further outwards until they were constantly in conflict not with just the uh, Australian or the the um, European settlers but also with the other indigenous people that they were being mm. forced to interact with. Yep, yep. And, you know, I mean, anyone who has uh, grown up in Australia and has enjoyed uh, the wealth that the country has produced in, you know, whether it be from mining or from sheep or from yep. whatever, um, needs to consider that... Um, this has all taken place on land that was never ceded. Yeah. Um, and you also, we also need to consider that 
that our beloved country was founded on a lie, mm. and that lie being terra nullius, yeah, empty land. which which um, we all now know to have not been the case. Well, I think they knew at the time. They, of course, they, <laughs> of course, they knew at the time. Yeah. Um, but you know, it 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 took many years later, and and um, a few scientists to yeah. to disprove it. You know, which the lie that was um, known fully well. Yeah, no, it's... Um, That's, there seem to be all of these sorts of things, though, right, where it's like, we're here now, so what do you do? You can't change anything, no. right? And yet, you know, you get a lot of hate towards British col- colonialism, but had it not been the Brits, it would have been the French, or it would have been the Dutch, or it would have been the Portuguese. You know, it would have been another group that would have come in and done the exact same thing eventually. And so it's so hard to work out what's right and what's wrong. And then on top of that, there's a layer of how do we, how do we make it right by giving by channeling the wealth of Australia back towards the Indigenous community without further screwing it up, right? Because if you say with the inherent problems that a lot of communities currently have with violence and drinking, if you were to just throw money into that community without controlling it in one way or another, it may make things worse, right? Which, But, but at the same time, if you're the kind of person who's a bit more libertarian and you say, well, people should have the right to do whatever they want, you might say, well, you don't have the right to tell them they can't drink or they can't, you know, spend their money on whatever they want. So it's it seems like that's also such a it's such a difficult thing to work out what the best course of action forward is, right? Do you have any thoughts on that? And well, I do, um, and I think that what a lot of money over the years has been thrown at Indigenous affairs in one way or another. But very little has been um, achieved with the consultation um, with with the elders or with the people of um, whatever place, um, whether it be the Northern Territory or Far North Queensland yeah. or West Australia, um, you know, and and that is. Pretty much what Aboriginal people are saying today is, you know, um, we we have the answers. They are saying we know what our people need, and and I believe that they are a special case. Yeah. Um, I I I don't um, subscribe to the um, to the view that everybody should be treated the same. Yeah. I think this is a special case. Yeah. Um, and. But I guess that's the difficult thing, right? Because you may have people in Australia who are in effectively the same circumstances as another group of people, but because of their race don't get treated the same. And that's where, it, at least on my sort of level, that's what seems difficult for me to justify it. Mm. But I can, I mean, I can understand it, but at the same time, it's tough when you're at the level of, say, saying, well, this person's a different skin colour from you, so they deserve, yeah. you know, X and you don't. It, it would, it would all have been so much easier if we had have done the right thing in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, look at New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, but I think too, with New Zealand, they tended to, they had to make an agreement, right? They were fighting the Maori who were a warrior group of people and were one homogenous kind of nation, right? As opposed to a lot of conflicting nations and posed a significant threat. Well, I, I think um, the first settlers in Australia couldn't believe their luck, you know, mm-hmm. when they when they ran into such a passive people who, um, you know, they were, they were able to bribe them with sugar and tea and things like that. And, yeah. and yeah. Um, they were getting paid with that for quite a long time, yes, weren't they? Yes, yes. And... You know, um, I mean, it really is a tragic story, but... Another aspect of that that's really tragic was the way that the women were treated, right? Where, again, whether indirectly or directly of their um, volition, quite often because the women could be obviously used by Indigenous and British or immigrant um, men, they quite often ended up having children with those men. The children were treated di- differently by both sides, and so it led to like all these other more complicated, mm. you know, relationships and things happening with the people that further decimated their kind of. That's right. Their homogeneity, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, one of the things which eventually came out and is common knowledge to all Australians today is, um, 
the stolen generations, mm. you know. And um, do you want to give people a bit of a history background on that quickly, if you can? Well, ooh, just um, the basic idea of what happened with the stolen generation. Well, it it was to be as nice as I could possibly be. Um, it was well-meaning. Um, the powers that that be uh, at the time um, believed that uh, by um, by taking black children from their or Aboriginal children from their families. Quite often who tended to be um, what would call at the time half-caste, right? They yep. had a, a white parent and a black mother. But not black. exclusively. Yeah. But in many cases... But that was justification yep, quite often, right? It oh, was. we need to save these mm-hmm. half-European That's right. children. That's right. And so many of those children were taken from their families and um, taken, uh, in many cases, a long way away from their families you guys will see and, this in rabbit proof fence yeah the movie, if you rabbit proof fence yeah absolutely a fabulous movie um and in many cases those those um families were were never reunited and you can imagine that um those families suffered immense grief from that separation and, and that, it was a cultural warfare to some extent, right? Where absolutely. Where they wiped out language, wiped out culture because the children were banned from speaking yeah. that culture. Mm. They were quite often put mm. in a place where other children had different languages yep. so they couldn't communicate yep. with them but for in English. And, and um, you know, there, there are people who believe that um, one of the reasons for doing this was not only to... Um, benefit those children to to give those children a chance of a better life but the idea was also to speed up the demise yeah the breeding out of the the black people breeding breeding out and i mean a lot of people in our history people who are regarded in our history as um um you know uh celebrities or or people of um great um, wealth and uh, um, I'm trying to think of the name of uh, what was Gina Reinhardt's father's name? Uh, Lan Hancock. Yeah, okay. Hancock. Yeah. Um, he uh, had the idea that, um, and and this is this is um, common knowledge. This is you can access this in Wikipedia or wherever you like, but. His idea was to poison the water mm. to speed up the demise of yeah. of the Aboriginal race. Yeah, and, there's and, few stories like that, right? he, where they were poisoned by by um, white people. And he today is considered a great Australian because he made billions and billions and billions of dollars mining the land mm. that was never ceded. Um, yeah. You know, and I mean recently. Um, Australia lost um, uh, a man who was considered to be a great Australian uh, in Tim Fisher. He was a leader of um, the um, the National Party for many years, and he was a very very nice man. Um, but he was one of the people who, when the Mabo decision was up uh, in the courts, and uh, and and it uh, looked like it had a chance of succeeding he was one of the people who was warning australians that aboriginals were coming after their backyards mm. you know and yet you know he was a great australian i i felt quite uh sad when i learned the news that he'd passed away but i just that, couldn't so help but right? couldn't help but think you know um what why would he do something like that you see know? you would imagine yeah I mean, and embarrassment, and and yeah. and as we now know, the Mabo decision was was um, uh, successful. Um, that was something that uh, Aboriginal people went through the courts for well over a decade, mm. fighting that, and eventually um, they won. And um, as far as I know, uh, nobody has lost their backyard. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Just one guy, but we don't care about that guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he um, so, so you know, I mean, through history, there's 
um, there has been a lot of uh, opposition to mm. any kind of um, any kind of uh, leg up to Aboriginal people. Yeah. There, there seems to have been a a desire on the on the part of people in power to to rub their noses further into the dust. Yeah. You know, it's it's so complicated because I I remember in some of the stuff that I was reading too there was a very rigid hierarchy in tribes, right? Where the elders were obviously the conduits Mm -hmm. of of knowledge. And so everyone had to bow down to the elders. But the moment that um, colonists came in and started giving away things that were of great value in these tribes, like axes and everything, all of a sudden the younger guys Mm -hmm. could now, um, you know, get a lot more power a lot faster and sort of undermine the tribal structure as a result. Mm. And so, yeah, it was very... And the same when I think they started working full-time jobs as stockmen, all of a sudden men disappeared and the tribes broke up and people went to different places and you had men who were now self-sufficient at a younger age. Mm. And so it it was so interesting to find out how at least Indigenous culture as it was in Australia prior to us arriving was inevitably disrupted by capitalism and the way in which you know our society has evolved and how you reconcile that today is so difficult too right because okay we want to help indigenous people become wealthier become better off move up in in you know quote unquote societal class or whatever but how do you do that without education western education so that they can flourish in western society but which requires quite often the loss of their own culture, at least to some extent, right? Or their own language skill or their own understanding of their land because they have to move to Sydney for a substantial part of their, part of their young life or something. It's, and that's what the, I find so, I'm so conflicted because you're kind of like, on one level, you want to say, we want to conserve what you guys have and we want to encourage that. But at the same time, we're saying, but really we need you to become like us. And leave that behind. And mm. so it must be so difficult being an Indigenous person too in isolated parts of, say, the Kimberley or Darwin and deciding, do I want to, do I identify as wholly Aboriginal and I want to stay here forever and do this? Or am I looking for opportunities to better myself and my current situation and have to leave part of this behind and have to make a choice, mm. right? That must be a rock and a hard place. Well, there are some amazing Aboriginal people that are managing to do that. Yeah. They've been through our schools and our universities and they've risen to very high levels of um, journalism or, um, you know, many fields. And they have become very powerful spokespeople for yeah. their for their people. And they have a really good understanding of um, both cultures. And um, one of the things that... Um, we could learn so much uh, from Aboriginal people about is um, family. You know, family is everything to Aboriginal people. And that is why um, Aboriginal people often, um, they often refer to um, each other as brother and uncle and auntie. And they, they feel part of, they all feel part of the same family, and also it. It I believe it has, um, because as as we touched on before, the stolen generation. So many people, um, so many Aboriginal people are to this day still feeling lost because they've never regained that connection, and and it's not like uh, the stolen generation is something that has. Uh, something that happened in history and now it's all over it's all healed Mm. it's not it's still going on rolling out absolutely and um well i i said when i was looking into indigenous languages especially in victoria i was talking i had an interview with a guy who was i think the person in charge of um, the conservation of australian languages somewhere in some part of melbourne and he was saying it's a really tough thing to try and talk to people about especially in victoria because the languages have all gone extinct, even though the people are still here. And so they, rightly or wrongly, might blame you or be offended by you wanting to learn that language or learn something about it because it's been taken from them historically and they no longer have access to that or that knowledge. 
And so it is, it's one of these things that's like, Ooh. and that, that's what's so hard, I think, today with all the languages in Australia that I think there's still 250, 250 or so of them. But I think only 15 of those have more than a thousand speakers. Mm. And so we're going to lose a lot of them pretty soon. But at the same time, there's no push for it to kind of, the government's not doing a lot, I don't think, at least from my limited understanding, trying to conserve these things and and encourage the passing on to um, the next generation in schools and that sort of thing. Yeah, no, there there are there are pockets of hope as far as that goes. There are some schools that are uh, that are doing things off their own back. You know, um, yeah. if if they have the community I think around in Central Australia, yeah. a lot of that's happening mm. around Alice Springs, right? Yep, and in the Kimberley. Yep, um, and I think. Um, that you know aboriginal people know that e- education is the key yeah and and you know we know that as well um it's putting the two together though right like trying to really foster the culture and the and and their their language maintaining that but at the same mm. time giving them the skills to be able to flourish in today's society as well yeah yeah that's right and the problem i guess too is that you have a huge number of different groups that aren't just Indigenous Australians in terms of one homogenous group. You have Indigenous Australians of all these different tribes from mm. different parts of the country that want different things that yep. may be at different levels of uh, integration into, you know, quote-unquote civilization where mm. they don't necessarily need your help or there's other ones that are isolated yep. from everyone and need massive amounts of help. Yeah, but I think I come, I come back to the thought that... Um, I do believe that Aboriginal people have a special case in Australia. I, I don't think we can think that everybody must be treated the same. Mm. You know, I do believe they are a special case because they have been dispossessed of everything over such a long period of time. And it's got really going to take, um, you know, I mean, our prisons are full of Aboriginal people. Mm. Um, a lot of work needs to be done there, you know. Um, those, a lot of those people, if they don't get some kind of a break, if they don't, if they don't get some kind of, um, rehab in a, in a serious way, they're just going to continue. The cycle will just go on and on and on. Although funding needs to be put into the communities, right, to ab- prevent them from ever going to, to ab- prison, ab- for whatever ab- reason they're ab- ending ab- up there, right? Absolutely. And and this idea that um, you can't do, you know, you can't um, give everything to Aboriginal people or, or that, uh, you know, they're no more deserving than than um, some other part of the community is just crazy because... Mm. You know, I mean... Uh, I guess it's one of those questions, too, of where you can probably do the most um, good with the least amount of probably resources, right? Or at least mm. in a very short period of time. Yeah, but as we started off with in this conversation, uh, I, I do believe that um, the groundswell of Australia, just everyday Australian people, is growing stronger and stronger all the time. and yeah. And... As with most things, um, do you think that's due to the internet? It's sorry prob- to interrupt you there. No, but... no, no. It's probably got a lot to do with that. Yeah. Um, and knowledge. Yeah. We, well, the internet helps with 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 all of that. Um, and because you can imagine, I guess, back in the eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, even the nineteen when my parents were born, it wasn't so much that people were actively trying to oppress indigenous people. I would imagine that ninety nine percent of Australians just knew nothing about it. That's right. And there was nowhere to learn about it unless they dived into books in a library mm. that were probably written by someone who had an agenda. Yeah. And the, the other thing I'll say about Aboriginal people, um, and, and this is a really um, practical thing that every Australian can do, is, you know, go out of your way, make a point of, of meeting some, in, some mm. Aboriginal people and getting to know some Aboriginal people. You will find that they are, you know, they are very funny people. They they love a laugh. They they're very sociable people. They love the fact that you're interested in their culture. Um, you know, just do yourself a favor and and you know. Um, 
How would you suggest people do that? Anyone listening right now, if they were saying, you know what, Ian, I'm going to go do that tomorrow, what would they actually, what would be the way of doing that? Um, well, there are, in depending where you live, but there are uh, groups, uh, there are reconciliation groups, there are, um, um, you, if you are involved in a, in a sporting club, there are likely to be Aboriginal people involved in the sporting club. Um, if you're, um, uh, you may have an Aboriginal person at your school. Um, you may have, um, you may go on holiday to, um, an area where there are Aboriginal people. Well, you know, just don't stay in your hotel with your, um, in your comfort zone with your, um, white Australian friends. I find um, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also for people living in Melbourne, yeah. I should just mention that there is a, um, there is a fantastic app that people can get. It costs about $5. Um, but once you've got it, you've got it for life. It's called Melbourne Dreaming. Yeah. So what does it say here? A guide to important places of the past and present by AIA TSIS. That's a, um, Aboriginal Australian Institute, right? Up in Canberra. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And that's a fantastic, uh, app. It, um, shows you places of interest around Melbourne. Um, Lots of stories you can listen to, lots of um, little guided tours you can do. Um, you can explore um, so many, so many things around Melbourne, um, and also in Melbourne at Federation Square is the Koori Heritage Trust. Mm. A Koori is um, a name for an Aboriginal person from Melbourne or from southern the southern states of australia yeah sort of surrounding it's all the clans of the surrounding area here in victoria i think yeah yep and as far as south australia as well but not the west yeah um and could be even into southern um new south wales but um yeah it's just a name um i remember curry cream yeah used to have as a kid yeah and they, it was a brand of um hand cream and my mum was obsessed with it because it was like really really good and then i think they went out of business or it disappeared but i remember mm. i think that was where i first learned the word uh curry cream right yeah. <laughs> but at, at the curry heritage trust um which is in federation square um there's a gallery there which is um, constantly changing. Uh, a lot of young Aboriginal artists get to display their work there. Um, there's a lot of historical archival material there. There's a shop where you can buy um, all kinds of um, Indigenous um, wares. Made in China. <laughs> no, no. <Yeah. laughs> No, no. And I said that because no. I want to bring up, make yeah. sure yeah. if you guys are going to buy Indigenous... Um, products of any kind, make sure it's not made in China because a lot of those places, say if you walk down Swanston Street in Melbourne or probably, you know, the middle of Sydney, you'll see a lot of these um, souvenir shops mm-hmm. and most of the stuff they're selling is made in China. Yeah. So, it's ripped off or it's made in Indonesia or something. So, make sure that the money is going to Indonesia. Yeah, well, that, that's another thing. Uh, I mean, um, in more ways than one, Aboriginal people have been ripped off um, ever since... Um, colonization and that's one way that they're being ripped off today Mm. by their incredible art Um, but um, also you can do um, special indigenous tours around the royal botanical gardens in melbourne at different times um, especially around uh, nadoc week which is in july Mm. but they they do um, at other times of the year as well and um uh, the other thing I was going to mention was, yes, you could, um, if you would like to try some indigenous food, there is a restaurant in Gertrude Street, Fitzroy, called Charcoal Lane, um, which is a, a training school for indigenous um, students of hospitality. Yeah, cool. But it's also an active restaurant. Yeah. And... Um, Pretty much uh, the menu changes all the time. You can go online and have a look at it. Uh, that's... And it includes Indigenous food only or mm-hmm. just partly on the menu there? No, no well, um, mostly uh, things like um, 
sauces and condiments and mm. all that sort of thing are made from um, what we call bush tucker. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and What's also, bush tucker for those who don't know what that is. Uh, bush tucker is basically um, uh, food that is produced from um, wild um, wild um, plants or animals. Plants. Right? Yeah. So tucker Ma- means food, yeah. right? T- tucker is uh, is an Aussie expression for food. Yeah. And um in, and they they will have on the menu uh, most days they'll have wallaby, uh, occasionally they'll have uh, crocodile. Oh, brilliant. Um barramundi. Um it's a great pla and and um it's been going for a long long time. It it's Ironically, it's um, housed in what used to be the venereal diseases clinic. <laughs> in, <laughs> just what ran out of, out of business today. <laughs> in, <laughs> in, to G- in Gertrude Street, Fitzroy. Yeah. Um, but uh, that it's a fantastic uh, restaurant, and and all the people that are working there, the chefs and the waitress waitresses and waiters and the admin people, they're all trainee Aboriginal or Koori, um students and um and it's also quite uh, an educational experience because um there are, there aren't just all these things on the menu that you eat um you you can learn about all the different ingredients mm. and you can buy ingredients um so a big thing here is just show curiosity, right? Be interested in Indigenous yeah. culture, Indigenous people, Indigenous languages. Yeah. And just don't be afraid to dive in and try and yeah. learn more about it and make connections with people. Yeah. And don't just uh, sit at home and watch whatever comes up on the telly. Switch on to NITV, Channel 34, and you will find night after night, day after day, incredible programs, documentaries, um Sports, movies, um, all kinds of, you know, even children's programs through to um, uh, dramas, um, soap operas. Uh, there's every kind of um, uh, program being made by Indigenous people in Australia. Mm-hmm. And it's a 24-7 channel. Yep. And I, I think it's all over the country. It's not just Melbourne. It's all over 34, the country. 34, yeah, that's been around a long yeah. time, I think. Yeah, yeah it's just... And NITV is National Indigenous Television. And I think the main, I'm not sure whether the main studios are in Sydney or, or whether they're in somewhere like Alice Springs. I'm not sure. But, mm. but in any case, um, it, it's one way that you can, from the comfort of your home, um, find out a lot more about Indigenous Australia. Oh, cool. Ian, so last question, I guess, before we finish up. If you had a magic wand and you could, you know, make any changes that you wanted to try and level the playing field, what would it be? What do you think needs to be done? What are the biggest um, changes that would lead to the the best results? Um, I think... I think if we... If the people in power, the people that have the power to make big changes, um, could be more respectful and take more seriously the opportunity that we have as a nation to, to really mature, to really come of age as a nation, um, that would go a long way towards um, truly, truly becoming um, a very, very special place in the world. I mean, it, we are already a very special place in the world, as we all know, but um, we could be so much better. Yeah, brilliant. Well, yep. Ian Carpenter, thanks so much for coming on. Cheers, mate. Anna, you too, in the background quietly the whole time. <laughs> all right thank you so much again ian for coming on the podcast it was an absolute pleasure having you down for the day i had a lot of fun it was great to meet you it was great to hang out guys i hope you enjoy this podcast uh again 
take it with a grain of salt, take it for what it's worth. This is just sort of our personal views and our experience learning about Indigenous culture and our views on Indigenous culture. I definitely have a great deal more to learn on this topic and I'm going to hopefully get some more Indigenous people on the podcast in the future because obviously it's much better to hear from the horse's mouth than from mine. (laughs) Uh, But besides that, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a great week and I'll chat to you soon. Peace. Peace.